Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. As we continue in our study in Zechariah 7, as we read the words that were presented at the time when the temple was being completed, shall we ask our Heavenly Father to guide us now so that we might more clearly understand how this applies with us and how this applies as the temple that is built without hands is to be finished. Shall we now pray? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for the many things that you are doing in our lives. We praise you for the way in which you are directing us. We ask now, Father, for your direction and guidance as we open your word. Help us to understand so that your will may be done in our lives, so that we may more directly have the personal experience, as did Daniel, as did others, where we may learn what it is to reflect your character. Be with us now, Father. May your spirit open our minds. May your angels protect us, for we need you. I thank you for each one that is here. I thank you for those that will view this later. Be with us now. Direct us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, when we were finishing last week, to recap quickly, this promise of blessing should have met fulfillment in a large measure during the centuries following the return of the Israelites from the lands of their captivity. It was God's design that the whole earth be prepared for the first advent of Christ. Even as today, the way is preparing for his second coming. These promises were conditional on obedience. The sins that had characterized the Israelites prior to captivity were not to be repeated. Yet, are we not seeing these sins repeated today? Yeah. Well, one of the things we notice here that um, we, we need to pay attention to is that Ellen White is making a parallel, right? Yes. And, of course, we see this all the time in Scripture. History is being repeated. Prophecies, you know, in a sense, have a repetition just because the history in connection with the prophecy is repeated. Not that the prophecy has a, you know, all prophecies have different applications. They, it's the history of that prophecy that's repeated. Now, if we think about this in the context of the second temple, that's going to be under the second decree, right? So we got Cyrus's decree in 536. Uh, 20 years later, we have Darius's decree in 516. And then, of course, we have Artaxerxes' decree in 457. So these three decrees parallel the three angels' messages. And so if we think about this in the context of the second angel's message, we understand that in our history that 9-11 marks the arrival of the second angel's message. Right? Right. And... And that message is in the second angel's message in Millerite history, Revelation 14, and then the repetition in Revelation 18 is, you know, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, come out of here, my people, in Revelation 18. Now, we also have um, who who completes this temple. We've we've talked about it before, but just uh, a reminder. Well, it's, it's not um, Zechariah here just before. That second decree, it's so not like the fourth year of Darius. Yes, it's decree. before the decree itself. Yes, right. Yeah, you're correct here because this is it. But but it's it's connected. So this is going to lead to Darius's decree, right? So they're going to start building the temple under the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. Then the enemies are going to come and uh, complain, right? The message gets back. Uh, to Darius, he's going to do a, a check of the records, and he does a more thorough check of the records than did um, Paul Smyrtus, and he's going to find these records of Cyrus's original decree, right? So then he issues his decree in the sixth year of Darius, right? Not in the fourth year. But uh, anyway, the, the point, getting back to this point, who is the one that's going to complete the temple? According to scripture. Well, is it not Zerubbabel? Yeah, so Zerubbabel. Now, 
Zerubbabel, his name can be translated as out of Babylon, right? Right. Yes. Okay. So, so we can see here that then this second angel's message connected with the second decree relates to our history. Um, you know, it, so, so we need to, to keep that in, in mind that there is a building of a temple that's done then. And there's a building of a temple now. Of course, lots of people want to look for a literal temple. But we understand that this that this has to do with God's church. So God is doing a work on preparing us individually, but also preparing his church as a bride. Correct? Correct. But, so anyway, I just thought, you know, we should think about those parallels. Rich were the rewards, both temporal and spiritual promised those who should put into practice these principles of righteousness. Are these rewards offered yet to us today, just as they were to the children of Israel? Yet, Zechariah continues, but they refused to hearken, and they gave a backsliding shoulder, and they stopped their ears that they should not hear. Are we yet seeing backsliding today? Are we yet seeing less than our best effort today? How do we, how do we apply this? This verse 711 to us at this time. Definitely we've seen people who don't want to hear. Oh yes. Right. And, you know, and I've given examples of that, but, um, you know, we, we have to think about ourselves here too. You know, are we are we really wanting to hear a message that's going to have a cross attached to it? Are I we... think I think I think of it like a child, you know, when a child is rebellious and pulls away the shoulder, like literally uh, uh, the image of pulling away the shoulder and saying, "Don't talk to me," you know. I think of a kid like that. Don't talk to me. And they're pulling away and turning away. And I'm kind of, I can be like that when I'm, I don't know, just in the, in the middle of a feeling and it, the feeling is driving me to self pity or um, rebellious, just angry about something, angry at, God or just angry at a situation or angry at a person I pull away my physically turn away and that's what Israel is doing yeah it's definitely very very you know visual the other thing is so so that they give this alternate translation of backsliding sh shoulder which I don't know if I would have translated it that way which, of course, that was just their alternate translation. It's not the one that they they ultimately went with. But, you know, because this is more... Uh, um, now, the funny thing about it in Hebrew is... So so it says here they pulled away the shoulder. But <laughs> Hebrew is kind of interesting because it has two words that are going to be pulled away, right? Which we see in, in, in English there as well. But the one they translate as pulled is actually the word natan, which means a gift, right? To give the shoulder. So, I mean, if they're going to be really literal, they could have said give away the shoulder. But obviously the idea here is pulling away the shoulder. And then sa'ar, uh, which is to turn away, right? So obviously they're, they're, it, I mean, it's descriptive. We can see that this is what's actually being described, the pulling away of the shoulder. But I, I don't like the backsliding. I don't see that here in this, though. I'm pretty sure I've seen the, these translated as backsliding before. before. Well, but, consider Hosea 4.16 in comparison with this. Yeah. So in yeah, so in Hosea four sixteen, for Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer, right? So uh, again, you're going to have this word sa'ar being translated as backsliding, right? I don't I don't 
you know, and, and of course they slide it back, right. As a backsliding heifer is the way that they, they have it. But that's the, you know, I mean, that's what the King James has chosen uh, to call it, to translate that word. But basically they turn away as a heifer turns away. And so I mean, if we think of backsliding, obviously we, we have this all this association with backsliding. But what, what would be what would be what is this illustration in Hosea four sixteen describing regarding a heifer, comparing Israel to a heifer? What is the heifer doing? In which situation would this be describing a heifer? Wouldn't this be a heifer that's being called to its barn and chooses not to go? I've always pictured it as the heifer is trying to go up the hill, but he's he's sliding back in the slippery clay or mud, and he just doesn't have the footing to get up the hill. Yeah, which which is not what it's describing, right? Because we just think of the word because they chose to translate it as backsliding. But this is more really about turning away. So when would a heifer turn away? When it's trying to be herded into the corral at the barn? Yeah. That's what I'm thinking of more. It's just, it's an animal that won't be, you know, that is refusing to go where it's directed to go. Well, we have cattle here. I mean, I don't own them, but my friend across the way owns them. And they're they're semi-feral. So if you approach them, they'll either huff it, look at you like some bulls do, or, or, the, or the cows will just veer away from you like those. Let's try away like a horse would if, if you reach out and try to. Yeah, obviously cows that aren't, uh, you don't pay much attention to, they're going to be more resistant. I remember when I was at Silver Hills, Leroy had to sell one of his uh, dairy cows. And it was a old cow, huge. It's a huge dairy cow. And, um, you know, the way he got it into the trailer is he didn't like startle it or chase it around or anything. He just kind of walked around and slowly, you know, the cow just, you, you know, walking away from him, it ended up walking right into the back of the, the trailer. It's kind of funny. He says, yeah, he's seen people chase cows around, but he knew how to get the cow into the trailer without chasing it. But, you know, I can picture uh, other situations where we had to do uh, some castration of some cows. And, yeah, to get them through, like, the the squeeze and everything to get them it, it was just, I mean, they, they can fight against uh, being herded, right, being directed away. But anyway, that's that's really the way that this word is described. The pulling away of a shoulder here, of course, is not really talking about a cow, right, in Zechariah 7.11. I think the picture of, a, like, a, I've seen it with children who've been mistreated and, and they're, you know, not, they're not responsive to being touched or being talked to or uh, or they're upset or something, you know, pulling away the shoulder. So so anyway, I'm, I'm just not a, a fan of the word backsliding there because I don't think that that's what is being described in either of these cases. What of Jeremiah 7.24? Yeah, so in Jeremiah, um, but they hearkened not nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels of the imagination in their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Yeah, but not the same words. Okay. okay. Now, the other one that the that the translators had relied on was Nehemiah 9.29. And testifiest against them, that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly, and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them and withdrew the shoulder, and hardened their neck, and would not hear. Yeah, so that's exactly the same as in uh, uh, Zechariah 7.11. Okay. Right, so the same same expression. Here they have it as withdrew the shoulder. Yeah, so the same Natan, Sarar, Kethef. They also are going to harden their neck. Well, if you're stiff-necked, then... And you're not allow, allowing your shoulder to be upright, uh, then you're not going to be able to take on the yoke of Christ very well. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, and see, the main thing that I'm looking at here is that this is refusing of the cross, right? That's the picture I get more clearly, that we don't want to take up that cross. It's kind of interesting here in the Hebrew, this is more um, uh, a poetic uh, 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 with the words themselves, because you got uh, Sarar, and then Kathef, and then and then we got uh, Kasha, and then Oref, right? So there's kind of a poetic structure of the the words themselves. Anyway, okay. that would mean you notice in Hebrew, you wouldn't notice in English that it's kind of like a a, a poetic line or parallelism in 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 Nehemiah nine twenty nine. It's drawing the shoulder and hardening the neck. Anyway, from here. From a non-published article, the pen of inspiration writes, The Lord will have the whole heart or nothing. This is an all or nothing situation. We cannot serve man and God. Either we stand completely with the Lord or we stand completely with man and stand completely with sin. The lawyer asked of Jesus, What shall I do that I may have eternal life? The Lord Jesus answered, What sayeth the scriptures? How readest thou? The lawyer answered, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. Christ responded, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Luke 10, 25 to 28. How are we treating this question? How are we treating what the lawyer has asked? The law of God is plainly revealed. Will you or will I venture to find some other way whereby we shall obtain the precious boon of eternal life? Is there any other way to salvation except through Christ? What say you? How do we act about this? Well, the thing is, Like there's, you know, when it deals with um, the cross, there is no other way except by the cross. And and of course, Christ's cross is, you know, we yoke up with Christ. That is, we without him taking up that cross, we couldn't take up our cross. Okay. Will we, to whom God has given the opportunity to obtain light and knowledge, refuse to receive the message sent from heaven shall we refuse the light because in accepting the truth we shall see it will cause a separation from those who will not hear who will not believe shall there be concession made with you or me to bind up in bundles with the world they have pulled away the shoulder Zechariah 7 11 because the yoke of Christ they would not take, and refused to lift his burden. Christ said, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John 15, 10. Those who are disloyal to God and turn from the truth of God to fables stop their ears, lest they shall hear. They act like disobedient, stubborn children. Let us think for a moment. Is this describing those that are in the age range, let's say from 5 to 12, that are disobedient, stubborn children? Or is this describing all of us, including those of us that believe ourselves to be so fully adult? Who is being described here? God's people. Okay. And then they will blame and accuse the truth-loving and the obedient ones in the service of Christ of creating disunion among neighbors and dissension in families. Christ was accused of creating dissension in families. But it is the truth that works upon human hearts. Some see the cross involved in accepting the truth and refuse it. Some members of the family yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit of God and open their hearts to Jesus. Such divisions have ever been and ever will be. Shall I conclude to remain in darkness and unbelief? 
and refuse light from heaven because this will separate me from my neighbors? Which will we choose, Christ or the world? Will we bear in mind that God's law is binding upon the soul of every man? Some will keep it through the merits of Jesus Christ, hanging their helpless souls on Christ. Some will pull away the shoulder, refuse the yoke of Christ, and put their fingers in their ears, and care not to hear the words of the Lord. But this does not do away with the law of God. It is plain and decided. Thou shalt, and thou shalt not. Many walk in the dark cellar of unbelief. How many and done that? Um, so okay. when we deal with this um, dissension, right? Uh, if you just scroll back a little bit, what was the yeah. sentence? Creating this, Christ was accused of creating dissension. And, you know, we see this many, many times that the people who actually are causing the dissension are not the ones who are teaching some idea that, you know, the majority doesn't accept. Right. Because it's pretty easy. You know, if somebody comes to our church and they're 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 teaching something that's error, if we treat them correctly, no dissension is going to result in spite of what people always warn us about. Like if somebody's teaching some error, like and I've seen this so many times, you know, we have to protect, you know, the new members or we have to protect, you know, the pe people from this, whatever this error is. Well, they're actually not doing anything to protect anyone except themselves from hearing the truth. And, and sometimes it is error. If it's error, it's evident that it's error. You never need to worry about it. But I've actually seen truth create more dissension than error has. That is, the church can accept a lot of error from people, right? right. And you've we've all seen this. You can have people teaching all kinds of crazy things, and, and nobody really, really cares. You know, I've seen, I've just seen so much of it. But somebody comes up to the pulpit and presents the truth, you're going to see a lot of reaction because the truth hits home. It, it, it touches those sensitive spots where, where people have tried to uh, hide from the truth. So now it is true that division always exists. Such divisions have ever been and ever will be, right? You know, because there is this contrast between those who serve God and those that don't. But I, I always dislike it when when somebody argues against hearing something because it's divisive. That's not what's divisive. No. Right. People are divisive. Remembering what causes the shaking. It's the resistance to the truth. Right. They, they will rise up against it. And this will cause a shaking among God's people. That's right. So what you're saying, Matthew, the truth though, is going to be presented. What's that? Who's, who's what you're saying, saying that just reminds me of what's going on now with the Conrad Vine issue. That mm -hmm. what's causing the issue is his just presenting the truth of the matter mm -hmm. rather than, as you say, something which is uh, some false doctrine or something. Yeah, people are pretty upset about about it. Yeah. But it's upset about what? I missed what that was about. I read by about oh, right. the church not supporting people who uh, don't want to follow the mandates. The situation that we've had is that Dr. Vine has presented clearly, directly, and calmly the issues that have been before us. Now, over these last 24 years, we have seen multiple times where leadership has chosen a path that is more in keeping with those that wish to maintain their mammon, their money flow, 
than it is to truly represent Christ to the world. There are those within the Michigan Conference that would like to ban Conrad Vein from speaking altogether. There were votes that were being taken here in a church not even 90 miles from where I'm at as to whether or not they're going to allow Conrad Vine to speak again. Because what he has said has struck at the heart of a lot of sin that has been held onto. We are going to find that we're going to have the same issues. Mm -hmm. We are going to have the same kind of experience because this is no different than the experience in the Savior had. They act like disobedient, stubborn children. Is as direct a description as we are going to find for what's occurring at this time. Men may walk into the dark cellar of unbelief and decide it is midnight at midday. Where do we stand right now? How is it for us? Are we calling up, down, and down, up? For these that have gone into this cellar of unbelief, shall we believe what they say? If they will come out of the cellar or cave, they will see the sunshine. Christ said of the Jews, I have come as a light into the world, but men have chosen darkness rather than light. Because their deeds, their deeds are evil. As soon as men choose God as their portion, there will be a separation from the world. A neglected God is a terrible calamity to the men who chose darkness rather than light. Any thoughts on this on this passage? Okay. Verse seven twelve. Yea, they have made their hearts as an adamant stone lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. What is an adamant stone? What's being described here? Well, if you're adamant about something. Or... Something very, very like a diamond. Yeah, the, the thing about it here, I mean, they're, they're going to translate it as adamant stone. The word shamir. So the, the original comes of sense of pricking or a thorn, but the idea of a gem, probably a diamond. Right. So something that's very hard. Well, let's look at it this way. They have made their hearts as a diamond. A diamond is very hard, yeah. but a diamond is also very valuable. So they are putting what's in their heart as being as greater value than the law. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So when what's in man's heart is greater than the law, isn't this the most ultimate form of idolatry? Yeah. Well, it reminds me of, I um, can't remember the guy's name, but one of those Satanist guys where, you know, his do as thou wilt type of thing. But also that, that idea of, Following your heart. You know. <laughs> what, Angela? His last last name is Crowley. Yeah, I oh, followed it, Satan. Alistair Crowley. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. So they're they're putting their own desires above God's law, right? That is, they don't want to take up that cross, and and that's our nature. We're contrary to God. You know, God's love. We're not love. Mm -hmm. To me, it's interesting because. Zechariah is being very clear of, of this point, as was Daniel in his prayer. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they may not obey, they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured out upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. The curse of Leviticus. 26. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, the oath there, the word oath is seven times. Okay. Then it's the Hebrew number 7621. Oath, which is Shabuah. 
Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Now, when we're when we deal with that, now you just you brought this up on this Hebrew number seven six two one on the seven times. Yeah. Seven times six times two times one gives us eighty four. Right. And don't we have eighty four in the upper right corner of the eighteen forty three chart? Yeah. Well, seven times twelve they have there. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Now the alternate translation for this verse, the alternate in this, yea, they have made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law, and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the hand of the former prophets. Therefore, therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Christ stands at the head of humanity, and it is his purpose to lead us into high and holy path of purity. Christ's purpose is to lead us. But if our hearts have been hardened, are we willing to be led? If we are believing that what's in our heart is greater than the law, are we going to accept Christ's leadership at this time? By the wondrous working of his grace, we are to be made complete in him. But in order to manifest the character of God, in order that we may not deceive ourselves, the church, and the world by a counterfeit Christianity, we must become personally acquainted with God. What vision allows us to not deceive ourselves and to be able to compare ourselves completely and totally with Christ. Of a looking glass vision. The Mara. Now, our situation, our direction at this time, we have this matter. We have this problem because we when we are confronted with the vision, Hebrew 4759, what happens? What happened to Daniel when he was confronted with this vision? What happened to John when he was confronted with this vision? What happened to Ezekiel when he was confronted with this vision? Well, basically, they're broken. I mean, they, they see themselves as sinners. Right. Now, so from the chat, <clears throat> Ezekiel 28, 13, the list of jewels called the covering of Lucifer and of Satan. Beware of a mere external beauty. In the case where Saul had failed God, Samuel is sent to anoint the one that God stated would be Saul's replacement. All of those that Samuel considered, on which his eyes fell, God rejected. Why did God reject them? What did God say to Samuel? Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. Exactly. For Samuel 7. If we have fellowship with God, we are his ministers, even if we never preach to a congregation. We are workers together with God in presenting the perfection of his character in humanity. How can we present the perfection of his character if we do not have the Mara experience? This we may do by having the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Christ is full of grace and truth. Are we thus? He condescended to take upon himself humanity in order that he might show us what humanity may become by being united with divinity. He showed us what we might manifest of goodness, of mercy, of love, and truth in the human character by union with himself. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble 
and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah 57, 15. The word of the Lord to Zechariah the prophet should be heeded by someone else. The word of the Lord to Zechariah the prophet should be heeded by us. He says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother and oppress not the widow nor the fatherless, the stranger nor the poor. Let none of you imagine evil against his brother in his heart. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent by his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 9, 7, or excuse me, Zechariah 7, 9 through 12. Those who are handling sacred things need to tremble and to fear even as is represented by the trembling of Isaiah in the sixth chapter. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, should be filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When this grand and awful glory was presented to the prophet, he realized his sinfulness. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, that this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and the sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. When the majesty of and glory of God is revealed. Self will sink into insignificance. Those who view the glory of God will not wrap the garments of their own self-righteousness around them. They will not exercise a proud, lofty, overbearing iron will that will lead them to rule or to ruin. But their words will be words of contrition and meekness, and they will realize that they are men of unclean lips and dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Men who are now regarded as reliable businessmen in connection with the work of God must be converted. They do not bring the spirit of truth into their work. The fragrance of Christ is not with them, and they are not a savor of life unto life, and yet the end is near. This is the great day of atonement. And our advocate is standing before the Father, pleading as our intercessor. In place of wrapping about us the garments of self-righteousness, we should be found daily humbling ourselves before God, confessing our own individual sins, seeking the pardon of our transgression, and cooperating with Christ in the work of preparing our souls to reflect the divine image. Here again, what vision is this describing? Well, the Mara vision. Yep. Hebrew, as we as we would look at this, the Mara vision, Hebrew 4759. Unless we enter the sanctuary above and unite with Christ in keeping 
<clears throat> and unite with Christ in working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, we shall be weighed in the balances of, of the sanctuary and shall be pronounced wanting. Meanie, meanie, tekel, you farson. This is our day of grace. When this vision was given to Belshazzar, it was a message of judgment. Belshazzar had it presented to him. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. How did Belshazzar react? Did he humble, it, humble himself? Or did he continue to act as if he was a ruler and worthy above that of the law? What do we see here? Are we seeing ourselves? Are we willing for ourselves to be humble? Where we give up every precious sin, every sin that we've held on to. What are we to do here? What instruction do we have? And are we willing to accept that instruction? Therefore, it shall come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. This is a fearful pronouncement. Men who have gone to great lengths in transgression, who have never confessed their sins, will seek to bring all the reproach possible upon those whom Satan has worked to destroy, but who have repented and humbled themselves before God, confessing their sins to the sin-pardoning Savior and receiving pardon. Men who have not repented of their sins and have not received pardon will tantalize the truly repentant ones, repeating their wrongdoings to those who knew nothing of the wrong done. They accuse and condemn the repentant ones as if they themselves were guiltless. That's a hard thing to go through. That is a difficult situation in which to be placed. It has been shown me that the experience recording, recorded in the third chapter of Zechariah is now being acted over and will continue to be while men making profession of cleanness refuse to humble the heart and confess their sins. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken. They pulled away the sh shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as a diamond, lest they sh should hear the law, and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried, they would not hear. So they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. I'd like to take a look at that word uh, when God says, I would not hear. Okay. Is it is it like God won't hear them? Or what's the reason there? Or what is that word? Which one? In the Hebrew. When God says, I would not hear. The phrase. So just wonder. Yeah. Well, the phrase, uh, the word, particular word. They would not hear. I would not hear. Um. Just wondering, like, well, the word. is God? If we call, if we call, He will, He will answer. Yeah. So is it just go with the other? Yeah, but that's somebody that's calling upon God, looking for God to answer them. Right. These are people who right. aren't interested in what God has to say. So, my my question is just that. I would not hear. Is it God turning a deaf ear? It's just literally in Hebrew. It's just 
I would not hear. It's just the word hear, shama, which means to hear, and then lo, but it's in the form of um, I, right, in the case of the Lord, and and they, so it's in the plural, in the case of the people, that's all. So it's just he would not hear. He's not going to hearken to to them because they're not they're not listening to him, right? But anybody who goes to God, he will always hear them, right? Mm -hmm. But a person who pretends <laughs> to, right, obviously, they're not really calling upon God, right? They really I don't want anything. That, yeah, you said the word hearken, so that's like he can hear them, but he won't act on their behalf because they are false-hearted? Yeah. 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 They, they, they're not sincere in their cries. Mm -hmm. well, there's a there's a segment from Proverbs. Proverbs 1, 24 to 28. Because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early and they shall not find me. We compare this also with Isaiah 115. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Jeremiah 11, 11 and 14, 12. Therefore saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Finally, Micah 3, 4. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. The Lord is giving us a warning. Are we willing to listen or are we going to set it aside? When we compare... You can add... Go ahead. Sorry, Dwight. You can add Proverbs 28, 9. Okay. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Excellent point. If we choose to hold on to sin in any regard, God cannot lead us, for we have lifted up our heart above him. Any other thoughts or comments of what we've covered today? Any other thought in closing? What? All right. Go ahead. Comes to me is Paul's Paul's plea, brethren. You cut out there. He's Paul's plea, brethren. Brethren, pray for us. <laughs> That's what this came to me. Pray for this household because I don't want to hear curses and expletives on Sabbath, especially. But that's what goes on here all the time. Okay, agreed. So we will now close this session in prayer. Father in heaven. We seek you, and we need to understand what it is to seek you with our whole heart and not just part of our heart. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of that idolatry which we have practiced. Direct us today. Guide us in all that you would have us to do. We thank you for these hours of rest. We ask, Father, for your blessing so that we may learn and our minds might become more in line with that which you would have us to know and to understand. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. Direct us now as we go into the worship hour. 
for this. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.